Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us tonight for our Woo You event with Dr. Karen Lee, titled Stick the Landing, The Importance of Scleral Lens Alignment. I love that title. It's awesome. <laughs> uh, so I'll be your host tonight. tonight. My name is Dr. Arielle Serenzi. So I'd like to introduce our speaker for tonight, Dr. Karen Lee. She's the Clinical Assistant Professor at University of Houston College of Optometry. Prior to joining U of H, Dr. Lee served as the director of the Specialty Contact Lens Clinic at the University of California, San Francisco Ophthalmology Department. She is a regular contributor to Contact Lens Spectrum and is currently researching the sterility of scleral lens filling solutions. She is a re reviewer for Contact Lens and Anterior Eye and enjoys lecturing both domestically and overseas. Dr. Lee is a proud recipient of the George Mertz Contact Lens Residency Award, Vistacon Clinical Excellence in Contact Lens Patient Care Award, and the Jack Bennett Humanitarian Award. Dr. Lee is a fellow of the American Academy of Optometry, an advisory board of the Gas Permeable Lens Institute, member of the Cornea and Contact Lens Section of the AAO, and a member of the Ocular Surface Society and Paths President of the Scleral Lens Education Society. Uh, she's also a mom to a boy mom to two mm -hmm. sons and um, an amazing speaker. So we're super excited to have her. So thank you for joining us and I'm going to let you take it away. Thank you so much for that kind intro. Yes, I am a boy mom to two, a four-year-old and a one and a half-year-old. So I'm incredibly exhausted right now, but I'm so excited to get to just hang out with all of you tonight. Um, the topic of the webinar is something that is very near and dear to my heart, but truly it's also something that I struggle and tackle every day in clinic. Um, before I get into this lecture, I really want to say there's really no strict like blueprint to follow when it comes to getting a scleral lens to align to the eye. And there's really no one right way to do it. Everyone kind of does it differently and you will find what works for you. And if you have an amazing tidbit or fun fact you want to share, if you ever see me, just let me know because I love learning from each of you as well too. And so hopefully today, I will spend a little time and just shed a little light on the process that works for me. And maybe you will pick up a few nuggets of knowledge that can help you in some way. So let's get started. Uh, my financial disclosures are here. And before we dig into things, I wanted to just take a quick moment to review the three main characteristics that kind of set scleral lenses apart from our other contact lens modalities, right? So number one, these lenses, they are designed to vault the cornea and the limbus and essentially land on the sclera as gently as possible. This is the large reason why scleral lenses are comfortable because we're gonna avoid all those really sensitive corneal nerves. The next part is we have to fill the lens with a preservative free saline so that it creates a reservoir that will bathe the ocular surface and provides a lot of comfort, especially for our patients with ocular surface disease problems. Modern day scleral lenses nowadays are lathed in really high DK gas permeable materials. This is what will provide our patients with crisp vision, but also allow maximum breathability. So we maintain good ocular health. And, you know, I think most people who fit sclerals would kind of agree that usually vaulting the cornea and the limbus isn't really that difficult. Now, of course, you're going to have patients with, you know, overhanging blebs or really proud corneal transplants that can be really challenging to vault. But the majority of your scleral lens patients from the scope study, they are our keratoconic patients or our ocular surface disease patients. And so for those patients, vaulting the cornea and the limbus tends to not be that difficult. Where I find myself spending the majority of my time during the fitting process is trying to get this dang lens to land evenly and gently around the eye at 360 degrees on this asymmetric sclera, right? And so, um, you know, if you have any questions at all about these current bullet points I have up top, check out the Scleral Lens Education Society at sclerolens.org. They are a great free resource that is dedicated to all things scleral lenses, because essentially from this point out, the rest of this presentation is going to be dedicated to the quest of achieving scleral lens alignment. So my goals for tonight 
is I want to review the different ways the landing zone can appear on the eye and um, essentially kind of troubleshoot what you're seeing. And then, you know, maybe we'll review a little bit about the different types of landing zone customizations that are available and how we can use those customizations. And then of course, just touch gently on the different technological advancements that you can use um, in your practice to make this process a little easier. And so this is my flow for tonight. And I want to end with just a few clinical cases before we move on to some questions. So uh, before we get into things, the scleral lens landing zone, when we are referring to the scleral lens landing zone, what we are alluding to is essentially the outermost portion of the scleral lens. This portion of the lens is designed to align to the scleral conjunctiva. And usually, as you can see in this photo, it's made up of multiple, multiple peripheral curves. And um, it's really there to help us spread the weight of that lens onto that ocular surface, right? And so thankfully, this area of the lens is really highly customizable. And we need that because researchers have found, and I'm sure many of you have seen this also in your own clinics, we're finding that this ocular surface and the scleral shape can really vary greatly between individuals. The first study that I wanted to kind of touch on, the scleral shape study group, really provided a lot of insight on this subject, and I feel has really changed the way that I start my scleral lens fitting process. So um, this study, what they essentially did is they utilized a corneal scleral topographer, and they gathered multiple images from each patient in various views of gaze, primary, up gaze, down gaze. Then they took these three images and they stitched them together with software that was specifically designed to measure and map the sclera. These data points were then plotted onto graphs and um, essentially the peaks of the graph, they represent areas of elevation on the sclera. And then the troughs of the graph represent areas of depression. Along the very top of the graph, you'll see it goes from zero all the way to 360 degrees, and that represents the circumferential location of each of those data points. And so I'm going to kind of, you know, show you what their results found. The study essentially reported there were four different scleral shape groups, and I'm starting here with truly an oversimplification of the data, because I really want to get my point across here. But essentially, the simplest scleral shape that they found that, you know, comes to mind when we think about shape is the spherical scleros, right? So these are patients that showed very little change in amplitude in sagittal height circumferentially. So imagine almost a straight line that really has no real peaks or troughs to speak of. Of course, the actual data points when we look at them aren't quite as clean, but if you focus on the scale on the left-hand side of the graph, you'll see on that y-axis that there truly is barely any change. We're talking maximum of 100 microns of change from the highest to lowest point. So not quite 100% spherical, but you know, pretty gosh darn close, right? And surprisingly, this simple group, this is my perfect patient, this simple group was the smallest group of the four and only represented about 5.7% of the patients in their study. The next shape that logically comes to mind after our spherical patients would be our patients who would fall in the toric group. So again, an oversimplification, but these are patients who had somewhat symmetrical peaks and troughs that were separated by approximately 180 degrees. So rotationally symmetric. Again, the true data is not quite as clean as you can see here, but it's pretty close and it's pretty symmetric. And this group represented around 28.6% of the patients. So 28.6 having roughly a toric scleral shape and 5.7 having a spherical shape. Now, the last two groups are a little bit more complicated and, and in theory wouldn't do well in a spherical scleral lens or a toric scleral lens. The third group they found in the study was actually the largest group too, and it housed around 40% of the patients that they saw um, because they lumped together those 
who had asymmetric depressions or elevations that were approximately 180 degrees apart. And we are talking large amounts of asymmetry, like three to 400 microns of differences between the um, two elevations or the two depressions. So if you imagine looking at an eye, your nasal quadrant being 400 microns more elevated than the temporal quadrant. And so that's pretty drastically different in that meridian. Also in this group, they put in the patients that had a single large area of elevation or a single large area of depression, okay? And so all of those combined together were approximately 40%. And then the last group uh, didn't really follow the 180 degree separation. So these patients either had multiple elevations and depression. So this image on the left-hand side here, you can see this patient pretty much has three separate elevations and three depressions. Whereas the patient on the right only has one single large elevation and a single um, area of depression. And so uh, shockingly, thankfully, actually, only 25% of the patients kind of fall into this category. So what that means in my mind, at least, right? And they summarized it really nicely in this study is that in theory, around a third of our patients or a third of our eyes should do fine in a spherical or toric scleral lens. Spherical meaning the landing zone is the same, 360 degrees all the way around, whereas a toric landing zone has two different curvatures along the major meridians, right? Um, both of these designs are technically rotationally symmetric, so the patient could put that lens in upside down. It should not be a problem. However, the remaining two-thirds of patients have some type of irregular pattern, and really, they need a landing zone that's a little bit more customized to their unique eye shape. So maybe a quadrant-specific lens here, where um, the landing zone is different in each of the four major meridians, or even something uh, more custom beyond a quadrant-specific lens. Another great free resource that um, you know I read during residency, and it's a PDF that you can find online, but a, scleral, a guide to scleral lens fitting by AFE goes further into detail about scleral shape. And you know they talk about studies that show where the nasal conge tends to be flatter and more elevated than the temporal conge, and how you know scleral asymmetry tends to increase uh, at a rapid pace when we go beyond the limbus and push outwards towards the sclera and the cul-de-sac. So all of these little things I keep in the back of my mind as I'm starting a scleral lens fit. And you can see there's a little bit of a disconnect still. If you look at most diagnostic fitting sets and lens manufacturers have definitely gotten a lot better about this, but not that long ago, the majority of my diagnostic fit sets only had spherical diagnostic lenses. So the landing zones were spherical, same, same uh, curvature, 360 degrees around. If we think back to that study, that's only 5.6% of the patient population roughly. And so what commonly happens is you put this spherical lens on the eye and the first thing it does is it moves all over the place, right? And it's not the most comfortable, unfortunately. And um, here in this image, that's exactly what I did. I put a spherical lens on this patient's eye. It tends to drop down and out. And so one of the first things that I'm going to do when I'm trying to tackle a fit is I'm going to consider starting with a toric lens because around one third of our patients probably need more of a toric design anyways. And if you look at your fit sets these days, a lot of them do incorporate toric um, landing zone diagnostic lenses. And it's been a game changer for me. Another thing that I think about is when I'm choosing my diameter, I'm, I kind of have a minimalistic approach where I still consider, you know, what I'm treating. Is it a really, really elevated cornea because it's, you know, a severe cone, or is it a patient with a lot of ocular surface disease? I'm going to tend to go to a larger diameter. Um, but if it's not one of those instances, I do try to keep it a little smaller because I don't want to run into that asymmetry as I move away from the limbus. Another thing that I do, once I put this diagnostic lens on, 
I focus on both the dynamic fit and the static fit. So I do let the lens kind of do its thing. I have the patient blink. I pay attention to what the lens is doing on the eye. But then at some point, I will take my finger and my, the patient's lid, and I will just manually center that lens up and look at what the landing zone looks like in this static centered position. So I pay attention to all four quadrants, and I ask myself, what do I see? Is it tight? Is it loose? What changes would I need to get this lens to center up on the patient's eye? And so the goal, of course, right, what I hope to see in every single quadrant, I want to see a nice, even alignment where the large and small blood vessels, they just travel freely past that lens edge. And it just, I don't see any impediment at all. Okay. If I were to take an OCT of this scleral lens edge, I would look for, um, a bisection of that tissue. So this uh, conjunctival scleral tissue kind of goes right into the middle of that lens edge and just bisects that edge. And, you know, something that does tend to happen in primary gaze, I might have really great alignment in the majority of my quadrants. Don't be shocked when your patient looks off, you know, to temporal or nasal lateral gaze. Um, when they move to these extreme eye positions, the scleral lens also moves and you can potentially see areas that aren't aligned. And that's okay. Cause in your mind, you kind of ask yourself, well, how often is your patient looking, you know, incredibly far off to the right or to the left? Probably not that often. So as long as my alignment looks fairly good in primary gaze, um, I tend to be okay with that. More often than not, though, what I tend to see commonly, especially in the horizontal meridian, are areas of tightness, also known as compression. So here, the lens is pressing down on the vessels, and it's essentially restricting blood flow. One common question that I get in clinic a lot with my students is, Dr. Lee, how do I judge compression, right? And so the Typically, the easiest way that I describe it to my students is just look at the vessels and um, ask yourself what type of vessels are being affected right now. So in this image here, we have a larger caliber vessel that for the most part is traveling somewhat freely, but then a lot of our fine vessels are kind of blanched out. We see this like ring of, of white, right? And so areas that have fine vessel um blanching tend to be more mild than say this image here where we can see our larger caliber vessels are also getting squished. So if I'm seeing large vessel involvement, I'm going to think, hey, this area of blanching tends to be a little bit more moderate. So maybe a slightly more severe type of compression. And then lastly, is it happening further along in the lens or is it on the very outer edge? outer edge tightness, we sometimes we will call impingement. And if it's really bad, you can actually see the tissue overlapping onto that lens edge. And, you know, anterior segment OCT, I don't use it as much as I would like to, but in these cases, I do find that anterior segment OCT is super helpful in helping me diagnose exactly what is causing this tightness. So in this patient here, we can see that um, that area of compression is actually because the landing zone of this scleral lens almost has like a thick belly to it. And so depending on the manufacturer and the design that you are using, right, you can actually ask for either a standard landing zone design or a more tangent or linear landing zone design. So this is the exact same patient. Up top, we have the standard landing zone. And then down below, we have a more linear landing zone. And this was one of our students that um, no matter what we did, the lenses just tended to press down on the eye. He would get red and it would settle a lot. And he's actually found a lot of comfort in a linear landing zone design because some of our patients just have a more um, straight anatomy at that, you know, paralimbal scleral junction. Edge lift would be the opposite of compression. So instead of having the lens be tight and digging into the eye, here you actually have a little bit of lift away. And 
really subtle edge lift is something that can be missed easily. So I'm about to play this video here, but what I want you guys to do is to really pay attention to that superior lens edge. So usually we see a little bit of shadowing. So when they're looking straight ahead in primary gaze, you can kind of see there's a little bit of shadowing at that lens edge. And then when the patient looks down, that area of misalignment is enhanced and you actually see a break in the tear meniscus. And so if I'm seeing just slight shadowing, that's usually like a mild type of edge lift. If I'm seeing breaks in the tear meniscus and depending on how large those breaks extend in towards my lens, um, that's going to let me know like, Hey, it's either really lifted away or just a tiny bit lifted away. And you know, sometimes you'll actually even have patients. And again, OCT is amazing for this, where this lens edge actually never touches the conj at all. We can see a small gap going all the way from that limbal zone, extending all the way out to the very edge of the lens. And it just never rests on the eye. And so in this case, you can imagine this gap here, just acting like a tunnel for debris and air bubbles to get trapped underneath that lens as the patient blinks and looks around. It can also be quite uncomfortable for the patient if they are blinking and the eyelid is scraping across this lifted edge. And so in this case, toric markings, toric marking correspondence, so important. So in our video that I had just shown, this torque marking actually corresponds to the steep meridian. So if our steep meridian is lifted away from the eye and never makes contact, that kind of tells me my steep meridian is not quite steep enough. Whereas if this was my flat meridian, well, my flat meridian is way too flat. And I need to steepen that up. So understand that every lens manufacturer has their own type of toric lens markings and just know what they correspond to um, in that design. And, you know, a hundred percent perfectly fitting scleral lens. I wish I could say all oh, my patients were a hundred percent perfect. Um, truly it's rare. If I was being really picky, I could look at this patient here and I could say like, Hey, you know, around 10 o'clock, that one vessel maybe just a little bit snug. It kind of disappears and comes back for a little bit. You could be really tempted to make changes to this lens. However, before you go down that route, just take a moment and stop and just ask yourself, will flattening this temporal quadrant really cause any issues? Will it, will it actually help a whole lot? What's going to happen to the rest of the clock hours in that quadrant? Because oftentimes if I am not seeing that the ocular health is affected and my patient is happy, I'm probably not making any changes to that lens. Now, if you are seeing changes to the ocular surface, whether it is limbal staining, conjunctival staining, or, you know, a compression ring that just doesn't go away after hours and hours of lens wear, or maybe you're seeing signs uh, that, you know, there is debris and air bubbles accumulating under the lens as the patient's wearing it, or the patient's eye is obviously getting really injected as they're wearing their lens, then yes, please a hundred percent make changes um, because that's just not going to be healthy for the patient. So oftentimes these changes means we are further customizing these scleral landing zones. And I'm finding myself utilizing quadrant specific landing zones really often in clinics. So kind of matching up with the scleral shape study group found. And other studies have also reported that um, patients have a lot more uh, have a better experience with these quadrant specific lenses. So they have improved vision, decreased midday fogging, and uh, there are really, how do I say this? There's really sophisticated scleral lens designs out there now where even the diagnostic fit set is already quadrant specific. And they have found that, you know, potentially starting with a design like this can shorten the fitting process for you. Uh, when they compare quadrant specific lenses to lenses with spherical haptics, they're finding improved comfort on behalf of the patient they're not really seeing a difference in IOP between the two groups. And also, and this kind of makes sense, right? If we're improving the alignment of your landing zone, you're going to see a little bit of decreased tear exchange in a quadrant specific lens. 
I feel like tier exchange is still kind of out in terms of the jury. Not a lot of studies. It's not an easy thing to study currently. And people are, researchers are working on it. In my mind, I just kind of assume that most of our scleral lens patients really aren't getting that much tear exchange. And so we're going to have to maximize oxygen permeability in other ways. And, you know, truthfully too, our manufacturers these days are so good and the scleral lens designs have improved so much. The lathing capabilities are quite incredible to the point now where I would dare say that quadrant specific scleral lenses are kind of standard of care at this point. So not even really that advanced. When I'm thinking about advanced landing zone customizations, I'm thinking about the eye that potentially has some type of obstacle, whether it's a pinguecula, a pterygium, or a symblepharon, or you know a glaucoma surgery, some type of obstacle that's really causing us to have poor alignment. And we are you know, rubbing on it. Cause my ultimate goal is to always minimize all scleral lens interaction, especially your patients with symblepharon or these glaucoma blebs, uh, because chronic irritation to symblepharon can easily cause that symblepharon to continue to progress and worsen. And if you're chronically rubbing on a bleb or a tube, you could easily perforate that and um, cause your patient to have to, you know, have a revision. And then of course, those large overhanging blebs that extend beyond the limbus, those I truly wouldn't even attempt to fit that I would re refer back to the surgeon to see if they can revise it before they come back my way. And so advanced landing zone customizations that I use to try to avoid these elevation would include localized vaults. We also have notches and truncations. Notches and truncations are both uh, currently handmade with a Dremel tool. You usually have like a lab technician in the manufacturing uh, facility with a Dremel tool in hand, and they are notching or you know, truncating, which is more of a linear slice across the lens edge, they are still doing this by hand. And so these two are not quite as reproducible, whereas a localized vault where you have one specific area of the lens that's vaulted upwards, that's actually designed into the software program and machine laid. So localized vaulting is very reproducible and has been a major game changer. Now, before we can talk to the manufacturer and ask them to incorporate a vault or a notch for us, uh, we need to measure the surface irregularity that we are trying to avoid. Usually, and you know, a lot of my students at UH, I try to start by teaching them a more simple way to go about it because a lot of new grads may not have the funds to be buying a lot of fancy high-tech equipment. And so I'll usually say, hey, uh, start by measuring that elevation without the lens on, just get an idea because you want to be able to track progression anyways, right? Once you get a good idea and you can take photos, put a diagnostic lens on the eye and try to see where the lens is interacting with that elevation. If the lens is decentered, which a lot of times it will be because it's running into that lump or bump manually center that lens up. And then again, try to see what that lens is doing, how it's interacting. And from there, utilize your slit beam. So I will use the height of my slit beam to measure the vertical component of the blanching. So in this case, I had a patient come in, in her habitual sclerals, she's a keratoconic patient, and she had a pretty large pinguecula that was kind of irritated. And so I'm measuring the vertical involvement with my beam, I will then turn my beam horizontally and try to see how far into the lens edge this blanching um, travels. Next, I will take this horizontal beam and I will lengthen it all the way out to maximum like 14 millimeters, whatever it is, right? And then I will try to extend that light so that it goes from the very center of my lens to the center of my area of blanching. So all of this is going to give me one, the length, the vertical component, the width, the horizontal component, and then by rotating my beam 
and matching up my center of blanching with my lens center, it's almost like doing Lars. It gives you the location in degrees of where your vault or notch needs to be. And um, I'm also paying attention to the distance from that lens edge. So in this case here, this patient, if I were to attempt a vault, I would say, hey, it's got to be around 3.5 millimeters tall, one millimeter wide, approximately, you know, really close to 360, 355 degrees. And it's essentially right at the lens edge. So zero millimeters from the lens edge. And before you start measuring all of this, I tend to do this on 10X mag because on 10X mag is where you have the least amount of minification and magnification. So here you can see on 10X, I have my slip beam rotated to five, uh, which represents, you know, five millimeters. I shine my light on my little PD ruler and it's really close to that five millimeters. So it's actually pretty gosh darn accurate. Other things um, that I try to do, and this part is really kind of hit or miss. I try to estimate how elevated this area is. And so I tend to use an optic section, a really thin light. And I kind of pay attention to how this light deflects as I'm traveling over this elevation, right? And then in the back of my mind, I kind of remember, hey, you know, your corneal epithelium is around 30 to 50 microns thick. And then think about your stroma. And so in this case, after I kind of guesstimate that, I still will put a diagnostic lens on and just try to see how that lens interacts with this area. So if I'm looking at this video, I can definitely see my light is ever so slightly deflected outwards towards me. It's not, it's not entirely monstrous or anything like that. With my diagnostic lens on, I do see a mild amount of blanching. My large vessels are still traveling under. I can tell it's definitely compressed though, because we do have some blanching there, but above that area, I can kind of see some shadowing and maybe even a little bit of a break in my tear meniscus. And so if I had to guess and start with something, I would start with, you know, a hundred microns of elevation uh, over there. And that's usually around the clinically significant value to start with any less and it just doesn't really catch that area. Now, if you are one of our more seasoned practitioners out there and you have discretionary funds, there are three different scleral topographers on the market and this can really change your scleral lens fit, uh, fitting process. So we have the Eaglet Eye ESP, the Pentacam uh, CSP from Oculus, and then you have the SMAP 3D from Visionary Optics. Now at UH, I only have the SMAP 3D, doesn't mean that I restrict myself to just fitting their lenses though. Honestly, any data that I can get, I can still use that information and apply it to different lens designs out there. I will never turn away a um, good corneal scleral map by any means. And so the beauty of using this type of data is I can use it to design a lens that will allow for all of these crazy, you know, highly customized freeform designs that are truly unique to each patient. And um, I, I really do think this is going to be the future of scleral lens fitting, where patients just have these unique scleral lenses that are just for them. Of course, one of the biggest limiting factors in this fitting process is getting high quality images. So manufacturers will always tell you, hey, garbage in, garbage out. They can't really work with images that are missing a lot of data points, or maybe there's a lot of movement um, detected, right? And also, it's not, it's not always the most convenient for patients. So in order to get a accurate image, patients actually need to discontinue lens wear for a little while. And um, not every patient's willing to do that, one way to kind of get around this is maybe have your patient discontinue lens wear for just one eye, map that eye after the lens has been off for about, you know, two days to maybe a week. And then once you're done mapping that eye, they can discontinue lens wear for the other eye, let it rebound, wash out, and then you can go ahead and, um, and get an image of that eye too. On top of that, after you get a good image, 
you know, your basic GP rules still apply. So SAM FAP. So if your patient is not a habitual scleral lens wearer, you will have to perform an in-office um, over-refraction with a diagnostic lens of known base curve and known power so that the manufacturer can SAM FAP for you. But if I was in private practice and I dream about private practice and actually making money, um, if I was in private practice, I would have one amazing technician that I would just, you know, shower with gifts and praise. Cause right now, you know, keeping amazing staff is just so difficult. I would have one amazing technician teach them how to get good images. And I would make this just part of my scleral lens workup. So anytime a patient comes in and they want a, or they were referred for a scleral lens, you know, after getting auto refraction and topography, I would say, Hey, go ahead and get me a corneal scleral map of the eye. And then from there, um, that will streamline your fitting process, less remakes, less chair time. Now, one thing I have noticed, and I'm not sure if anyone else out there has noticed as well too, these really customized lenses that kind of fit like a glove to the eye. I've had patients that have struggled with removing the lenses. I have my theories and it's not tested by any means, but this is one of our students here who has a freeform lens on her eye. You can kind of see, despite her good technique, she's not putting that removal plunger on the very center. She's gently applying it. You see that it's just not coming off easily. So in my mind, I'm like, okay, back in the day when I used to work with microscopes and you had two little plates of glass, two microscope slides, if you put them together with a little bit of moisture in between, they were impossible to separate. You essentially had to like slide them apart from each other, right? So maybe there's like a parallel planes type of thing going on here where that, that freeform lens is just matching up with that ocular surface too well, or maybe that freeform surface doesn't have anywhere smooth for this plunger to stick to besides in the very center, which is where we tell our patients to not do that. And so some of the ways that I have been kind of circumventing this with my patients is I have been incorporating channels into the lens edge. Channels are nice uh, because, you know, they have been found to help you relieve suction. And they're essentially just venting channels that you can incorporate to help also alleviate discomfort and improve tear exchange. Uh, if a channel is not possible, I will ask my patients like, hey, just kind of gently take your finger, put it on your lower lid and go right by that lens edge and just indent the conjunctiva slightly. That will manually create an air bubble that will just travel up into the tear reservoir and help you break suction. And um, from there, you should be able to take your small removal plunger and put it right in the very center of that lens and pop it right off. And these two uh, incorporations have helped a lot with my patients who just feel like they're having a hard time removing a freeform lens. And essentially, that's kind of how I utilize these um, advanced landing zone customizations. And it kind of brings me to the last portion of my talk here before we take questions. I wanted to just end with a few quick clinical cases. So my first patient here is a 70 year old Hispanic female. She comes in with a history of RK in both eyes. She's already wearing scleral lenses. She says she likes them, they're comfortable, but after a few hours of lens wear, the right eye is a little bit fuzzier than the left eye. And they just kind of have a little bit of distance blur. She does report like, hey, if I take my lens off and I clean it, uh, put fresh solution and put it back on, my vision clears up again. So that kind of screams midday fogging, right? Because if it was corneal edema or something, you know, uh, more malignant, after cleaning the lens, her vision would probably still be a little bit hazy. Okay. And so we gather all of her entering data and we can see, you know, her auto refraction is through the roof. It's, it's truly not really matching up with her manifest refraction. She's seeing well, lenses have been on for about two hours or so, 2020 minus in the right eye, 2020 in the left eye. And of course, these post RK patients, her K readings are just really flat. They're in like the mid to high thirties. Well, 
I just want to give a quick shout out to any lens manufacturers out there because these lens laser IDs have really made my life so much easier. Thankfully, she had two laser IDs, one on each lens, and that kind of gives me a hint as to what she's wearing. And then I can call the manufacturer, give them this ID, and they can kind of look it up for me as well too. And um, one thing you will find though, is these manufacturers cannot just give out that information freely to you. It's kind of HIPAA. And they may ask your patient to sign a medical release form before they'll give you that information. But it still saves me a lot of chair time and um, not having to just start from scratch. So if we take a closer look at her, and again, this lens had been on for about two hours, the fit in general looked great. And then as I'm scanning around the landing zone, I kind of notice, hey, there's three tiny little drill dots near the lens edge. And these drill dots, um, if you guys are, if you guys kind of know, um, these drill dots are actually outlining a little localized vault somewhere. And when she presented, these uh this vault was actually kind of hanging out at around 8:30. Thankfully, this lens also had toric markings. So it kind of gives me an idea of like where three and nine should be. And so I manually rotate the vault just to see, you know, where is it interacting with? And sure enough, as I rotate this little vault, I can see that there's a small area of blanching here that kind of resolves, right? Those vessels just kind of come back and flow nicely. It resolves when the vault is in place. Now, after looking with white light, I'm always going to look with blue light. And when I switch to blue light, I can see that there's a, a decent amount of pooling. And this vault almost looks like it's maybe a little bit too elevated. So given her complaints of blurry vision that occurs after several hours of lens wear, and it resolves when she takes her lenses off and cleans them, I, of course, if, if it's midday fogging, I'm going to think, hey, Maybe this vault right now is just a little bit too elevated and it's letting debris and get sucked up underneath there and causing her to have that decreased vision. Thankfully, again, with the laser ID, I'm able to find out everything about this vault. So it's located at the zero degree meridian. It is eight millimeters decentered from the lens. This lens is 16 millimeters in diameter. So essentially what they're saying is it's at the very lens edge. It is one millimeter in length. So the vertical component is about a millimeter tall. It goes half a millimeter in towards the lens and the actual elevation of this vault, it's 250 microns elevated. And so again, the fit was beautiful. I really changed hardly anything. I, I, the only thing I changed was this vault rather than having it 250 microns. Cause I could see all that pulling. I dropped it down to, you know, the bare minimum hundred microns, um, elevation. Cause truly anything under a hundred microns, you kind of wonder like, is it really doing anything? Um, stability at follow-up. So fortunately for her, with the lens markings and having the you know dotted black dot at six o'clock, if I tell her to put that black dot at six, the vault does kind of go where we want it to go. However, over time that ink does rub off. We literally just saw this patient for the scleral program at UH and her her little black dot had rubbed off. And sure enough, her vault had you know rotated off somewhere where it shouldn't be. And um it doesn't bother her. Her midday fogging is resolved. The ocular health where that area is blanching, I don't see staining. And one thing that can occur, you guys, I'm not doubting at all. There definitely was something there. We could see that it blanched and it resolved. Areas of elevation that are inflammatory in nature. So maybe like a granuloma or, you know, an angry pinguecula. After you fit them in a scleral lens, that's one of the miraculous things. You can actually see these areas of elevation improve or even resolve. And so next year, if she comes back in and she's still very happy and her vault is, you know, in La La Land, I might just completely remove that vault because the practitioner prior to me did an amazing job and whatever was going on there has just improved. Now, our next patient is a 40 year old Hispanic female. And she came in with a history of 
blurry, fluctuating vision in her contact lenses at all distances, especially at distance. Um, if we look at her information, you know, steep K readings, the auto refraction doesn't look that significant besides the, you know, oblique axes. However, it's not matching up with her manifest refraction at all. So her manifest refraction, she corrects down to 2025 in each eye with a ton of astigmatism. And her presenting soft, um, custom soft toric contact lenses, the powers don't match up either. On top of that, she says, you know, my vision's not that clear in these. And they have tried many, many times to, to get clear clarity through these custom soft lenses. So we continue on with our uh, examination. We see, you know, corneal tomography findings at classic keratoconus, where you have an area of steepening and matches up with the area of thinning. And we can see this posterior float protrusion in that area as well. All of that screams, you know, keratoconus, right? And so from here, we talk about our options. She's tried small diameter GPs before. She's really not interested. So of course, all right, let's go ahead and get our scleral elevation map and just see what we're dealing with. This initial map that I'm looking at here, and you know, it can be kind of daunting because you're seeing so much information and it goes all the way out to the 10 millimeter core diameter. I tend to hone in on just the part that's going to be affected by the lens that I'm fitting on her, that lens diameter. So everything in, you know, outside of this ring, I kind of ignore. And what I see is, okay, we have a toric scleral shape, right? You see areas of elevation and depression. It's not really rotationally symmetric. And we also have two conjunctival hotspots, two, two red hot elevations there. The nice thing about scleral topography is you can get a lot of data outside of these maps. You can plot individual data points to find out exactly where something is located, how tall it is. You can use ruler tools to measure how wide things are, right? And so this is going to be a little tricky. Two conjunctival elevations. Can I do two localized vaults for this patient, right? If this patient had a single elevation, like my friend here, it would have been so much easier. This patient had a single elevation. It was straightforward. We measured it. We can see that the eye is a lot more calm and quiet when we incorporated that vault in the lens edge. With two elevations though, I mean, so now I got to stop and think, what do I absolutely need in this lens? Well, I feel I'm going to definitely need a back surface toric landing zone of some type because this patient definitely is not a spherical scleral shape, right? And now with those two areas of elevation, I don't know if I can do two. I feel I definitely need at least one localized fault. I'm going to ignore that small one and hope that I can just squash it and not pay attention to it because technically when I'm looking at this, it almost looks like my entire 16 millimeter lens edge is going to rest over that, but I definitely cannot ignore this large one in the temporal area. So I'm going to use my ruler tool. I'm going to measure the length. It's around three and a half millimeters or so. I'm also going to measure the location. It's around 352 degrees. And then in terms of width, you know, when you look at this red, you can almost say to yourself, well, that extends pretty much all the way up to the limbus. I'm not doing a full two millimeters wide. And the reason I'm not doing a full two millimeters is because when I put that diagnostic lens on, it doesn't look that bad by the limbus. Now, one last thing here, I don't have to use an optic section to guesstimate my light. I can use my ruler tool and I kind of take that ruler and I drag it from the center of my elevation along my lens edge out to where things kind of settle down. And you can see, it tells you the change in sag is around 150 microns. And so that's the height that I'm going to set my localized vault to. And so when I'm looking at this, right, my toric diagnostic lens, we can definitely see that there is compression there. We can tell the light is reflecting a little bit more. The blood vessels are gone. 
with my first trial lens, even though it says 2L, this is actually the first lens because the very, very first lens got stuck at like UPS or something and we never got it. Um, but you can see that the blood vessels are flowing a little more freely under that vault. It's definitely still not perfect though. I'm not gonna lie to myself, right? Inferior to my um, little air pinguecula, you can see that as she blinks, there's just a little bit of a break in tear meniscus there. Then the next area I'm looking at is the nasal area. So in primary gaze, that, that little bit of nasal pinguecula, it was a little bit compressed. As I have her look off in lateral gaze, I can tell, yep, it's definitely affected there. Well, you know, this is the bed I made. So let me just see what happens. I'm going to dispense this lens. And sure enough, she comes back in a, in a week and she says, hey, you know, my, my eye does get a little red in this area. I do find that my vision is decreased. I do have to take my lens off and clean it every now and then. We look at her, sure enough, midday fogging, a little bit of injection, a little bit of staining there. So when we talk to consultation, they strongly advise against two localized vaults. They're like, Karen, this doesn't work well. We've tried it before. Honestly, what we would recommend is incorporating a notch with the vault um, you, you might have better success with that. Okay, fine. Okay. I'm, I'm not going to argue with them because they honestly know a lot too. Right. And so, okay, if I'm going to incorporate a vault with a notch, I'm going to choose to put a vault over the smaller nasal pinguecula, and I'm going to incorporate a larger notch over the temporal pinguecula to try to avoid that whole area entirely. Okay. And so, with my second trial lens, after I get my measurements the same way as I did earlier, with my second trial lens, without the vault versus with the vault, I can see, yeah, my vessels flow a little more freely in primary gaze. As I have her look off towards um, her lateral gaze, you can see, yep, also a little bit less compression, a little bit more vessel flow. Um, this notch, when we look at this notch here, you know, we recommended a three millimeter tall notch by approximately three millimeters wide going towards that lens edge. And think of it more of like a, a um, radius of a circle that's kind of cutting in towards that, that lens edge. And it did take care of the midday fogging component, but when you have a notch like this, it can be kind of difficult for your patient to put the lens on. So she reported now needing to you know, try multiple times to put the lens on without an air bubble. She's feeling the lens a little bit. She kind of begrudgingly wears it at this point because she gets um, clear vision for a lot longer, but I am testing the limits and I'm asking for a lens with two vaults, one nasal and one temporal, just as an experiment to see how it goes. Right. And of course you're going to have patients that are really, really complex and you know, you can't talk about a scleral alignment lecture without talking about impression-based scleral lenses. I don't have any cases right now. This was literally this morning at 6.45 a.m. at UH. We just went through our iPrint Pro training, and this technology is amazing. Just seeing all the little nooks and crannies that you can get into these um, corneal molds. I'm really excited. Uh, we fit three different patients today who have essentially failed even free form lenses that we designed with scleral, um, corneal scleral topography. And so I'm excited, hopefully, to one day present some cases to you all utilizing iPrint Pro. Thank you so much for listening to my lecture tonight. If you have any questions at all, feel free to email me.